Eight. Really? Something Herbert Crescent. It's right. like two blocks from Harrods. Oh wow! All right. So we're speaking. Okay. Anytime you guys want to get going. All right, I'm good. I'll, I'll do the introduction. Awesome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are rolling into another episode of the Candace Owens Show, and today I want to talk about what drives people. You guys know that I am especially interested in stories of motivation, things that get people to start from nowhere and to go somewhere in their lives. And I am so excited to introduce you guys to my next guest, if you do not know him. Eric Prince, welcome to The Candace Owens Show. Thanks for having me. Guys, Eric Prince, just so you know, because I get all of the screams on YouTube, he is the founder of Blackwater, the private military contractor, and today he is the managing partner of Frontier Resource Group. Eric, I have to be really honest with everybody watching why I have people on certain shows. My husband, huge fan, demanded that we do this episode ASAP. There's actually a group chat that they're in, and they think you're the coolest person in the entire world because wow. of your uh, military history. So I wanted you to know that and be honest with everybody watching. Thank you, George. <laughs> All right. So I want to start at the beginning, uh, and, and particularly why I talked about a success story. Um, you have a tremendously successful family, and today people tend to think that if you're successful, it's just the way it always was. Um, and that is not the truth. Your father, I want to start there. Um, tell me a little bit about your father. I uh, grew up in Holland, Michigan. Okay, obviously a very Dutch community in, in West Michigan, right along the lake. And his dad died when he was only 13, during the Great Depression. And so he was the oldest of his uh, two other siblings and um, had a very uh, stubborn, stiff-necked mother who wouldn't accept any help from the state or the community or the church. They were going to make it on their own. And so uh, my dad was pretty much working full time from 13 on. And uh, he installed a hot water heater at age 14 in their house. And by 16, he was managing a local car dealership. And uh, you know, that he, he worked, he, he played one sport in one season uh, in his entire school career. And so he forbade me from working during the school year. So I'd play sports and pay attention to school. He came to every game and I played three sports a year. So uh, he, he grew up working hard. He knew how to, you know, I, I've had some, some success later in life in business, but that's a guy who in 1965, where he had three daughters, um, remortgaged his house and car and everything else and started a business from scratch with six other employees, which became Prince Machine. He, he made die cast machinery and then he started making automotive parts and that business is very, very well. You know, when you get in a car and you tip the, you tip the visor down, and there's a little mirror there with lights that go on. That was their patent that started in 1975. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah, and so that's they, really incredible. They and rode the wave of outsourcing of all those car parts that uh, you kind of take for granted, but they have to be made somewhere. So I have a, a controversial opinion, and, and this is kind of gets into my stance on welfare benefits and, and, and trying to give everybody just helping them, right? And are we actually helping them? I have the perspective that you should maybe teach a man to fish as opposed to fishing for him and giving him fish for free. And your father's story is interesting because he started with his back against the wall, right? So when you're back, I think our instinct, when your back is against the wall, you will fight, That's right. right? And if you take that away from somebody and you say, never mind, you don't have to fight, here's a little bit, you know, it's not really enough, but it's a little bit. Um, you're sort of removing that human spirit and the human spirit is what is needed to become really successful. Look, I think one of my dad's, uh, one of the things he always told us was one of the greatest things you can do is, is give somebody a great job because they find personal and professional satisfaction and fulfillment by trading their time and their labor and their effort uh, and, and, and to, to advance their own cause. Uh, you know, I have a contract manufacturing business today and in a very full economy now, we constantly butt up against the welfare state because we'll hire somebody and they'll say, uh, after 10 days, manufacturing is really not for me. I'm gonna go back on unemployment or welfare. Wow. And, and I think uh, a safety net is one thing, but not a permanent stasis of multi-generational uh, people trapped in that cycle because it, it, 
I don't think anything uh, great comes from that. Well, I can guarantee that. I was telling you before we got started why I found that story of your father so inspiring. I come from a family of people, multiple people that are on welfare currently, um, and they find my views to be extremely controversial, yet they inspired them. These are able-bodied individuals that turn to the government uh, for solutions that can go out and get a job, and yet when it becomes multi-generational and all you know is turning to the government to give you handouts, you actually don't know how to inspire yourself to get out of the current rut that you are in. It, it, it is a, it is a perma, it's a, it's almost a prison you place people in of that rut. And if you wanted to be dependent on the government for your livelihood, that is an awful place to be. It's hard because my, it's hard to fight out of it. That's right. My dad's told the story of um, probably about employee number ten. Okay, it was a, was a guy who was um, didn't have a lot of education, a pretty simple guy, and he was hired to be the floor sweeper of the factory and, and and he came in and he got overwhelmed and he was going to quit. And my dad said, no, it's all right. You can do it. Do it this way, not this way, and, you, and you'll make it. And after 30 years and my dad's, um, they had a, a stock option program for the employees and the guy retired as a millionaire. No way. Yeah. Started sweeping floors. He started sweeping floors and he retired as a multimillionaire um, because that was the, that's the piece of, of America, of American capitalism, that hard work and risk uh, can create great value. Right. And we say great value, by the way, you're being humble when you say, oh, my, fa my father found some success. Uh, he did find some success. And, and that company, how successful was it? You turn down the visor, everybody watching, every time you turn that visor down and the lights come on, you better think of Eric Prince and his family. <laughs> well, you know, it was originally designed in the 70s for that big beehive hairdo. And, uh, you know, which which was timely then. And they made the, uh, the digital compass and digital thermometer in your car. They licensed that from NASA, put it in a vehicle. And then uh, you know the, a lot of the guts of the of the interior of a car, um, but my dad also focused on giving back to the community, and he um, he gave ten percent of all pre-tax profits to to charities, and the employees got to pick, uh, and whatever they gave to the company would match it or double it, and uh, you know he, I, I remember at his funeral, uh, one of his friends just said Ed viewed wealth. As a uh, as a sword to fight evil and as a balm to help the inflicted, wow. and uh, and he lived it, and um, I'm still sad he's gone. Oh my gosh! Well, long live the legacy of Ed Prince. I, I think it lives on in you. And uh, your career took a, a different path. So you were a Navy SEAL. Yes. I love Navy SEALs. Everybody loves Navy SEALs. I think everybody loves Navy <laughs> SEALs. How did you end up there? I don't think the Bin Laden family does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Candace Owens has just been owned on her own show. I will give you that. That is exactly correct. How did you end up as a Navy SEAL? You know, the other policy that my dad had was that the kids couldn't come and work in the family business. So you had to go do your own thing first. And it wasn't a hard decision for me because I had, I frankly paid no attention to the business at all. I always wanted to be in the military. And, um, you know, I remember in 1976, I had my seventh birthday in East Berlin. Okay, and as a seven-year-old, even seeing the guns and the dogs and the minefields and the barbed wire all facing in, all literally keeping a people held hostage, held prisoner under a, you know, a communist super state, from very early on, I wanted to do some part of, you know, defending my country. And so uh, I wound up in the SEAL teams, although I went to the Naval Academy planning to be a pilot. And uh, I was a pilot in high school. Uh, and then uh, along comes Top Gun, and a lot of other people had the same idea that they wanted to be uh, pilots as well. But I'll never forget um, my first year at the at the academy, and there was two SEAL officers, two liaisons there, and that was the first I'd ever heard of the SEAL teams when they gave their little presentation. And they said, if you want to come out and PT with us, come out and exercise, come out at five o'clock the next morning. And they said, all right, today we're just going to run a mile, get a partner, put them on your shoulders. And, uh, and I was hooked. And uh, I ended up leaving the Naval Academy because I didn't like the school, but I wanted to be a SEAL. And so I, I finished at a civilian school, went to Hillsdale, um, and went back in through officer candidate school. And it was a fantastic program. I have um, a very, very high regard for the program because it's very, very old school. It is, there's it buds, I was just out there, basic underwater demolition SEAL training. The, the schoolhouse looks exactly the same way it did 30 years ago. Okay, I have to ask you, what is Navy SEAL training like, especially the underwater stuff? I've heard so many rumors. I know there's some books, but I, I want to know. 
Because I'm telling you, I can't run a mile with you on my back. So. It's hard. It's, uh, I'd say most people quit because of the cold and, uh, and being wet and sandy and cold all the time tends to sap your, uh, your soul. Give me a little something that I want to know. What do you do in the water? Just one thing. It's fine. Um, you know, surf torture, right? In, in the first phase, it's all about, do you really want to be part of the program? Mm -hmm. Cause it's a voluntary program, right? And they make it very easy, very desirable for you to quit. They make you miserable. And so, uh, you know, you, you know, the, the next event is going to be miserable when the doctor shows up, okay, with a thermometer because they're going to take your body temperature down to, you know, hypothermia. And so uh, uh, they line you up and they walk you into the surf zone and you sit down, the waves break on your head and you're linked together. And, uh, and that's it. So it makes you feel m miserable as an individual, but it also teaches teamwork, right? Because they encourage you to sing and to be defiant and to say, yeah, together, you know, screw you, you're not going to break us. And um, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic memory. It's a fantastic formation. And I really hope they don't change it. Wow. That is, that is absolutely incredible. So what did you do? So you became a Navy SEAL. Um, I'm assuming you can't tell me divulge all of the... Ah, you know what? I was a, uh, I was a SEAL on the East Coast and uh, I planned to stay for 10 to 12 years as an officer, those are kind of the best years to be a SEAL before you get stuck at a desk. Um, made a couple deployments, but then my, um, my father died and my wife got cancer and we uh, just had our second child. And so I got out of the Navy earlier than I planned to. Was this in the same year? Within a few months. Wow. Yeah, so that was a shock. And my mom asked me to come home and kind of help sort out the family business because there was a, you know the largest employer in our town 6,000 employees in a city of 30,000. So it was, um, it was a lot of moving parts. And so I got out and I really, um, it was actually one deployment. I wrote a letter home to my wife and laid out the business plan for what became Blackwater because SEAL teams and those kind of units have been using private facilities since the 1970s, right? You, you maybe have a karate dojo or a, a small shooting school, but no one had done it on an industrial scale. And believe it or not, as many ranges, firing ranges, as the military has, SEAL teams didn't really have great access to them. And so Blackwater was built as a purpose-built, phenomenal experience to deal with every kind of threat from one meter away out to 1,200 meters. So from, from knife fighting to vehicles to, you know, long-range sniper shots. And so built it. <laughs> I, I knew nothing about business nothing about land development and nothing about government contracting. What could go wrong? <laughs> and, um, you know, you kind of go back to the same um, gene pool that you know, right? I ended up hiring some other SEALs that I worked with and, uh, and we just figured it out. And, uh, you know, the name came from, um, it was a big track of old forestry land. And, uh, you know, when the rain would come through and hit this very organic soil called peat, which is also very flammable, um, by the time it made it to the ditches, it was very black, right? Literally our, our, our legs were getting uh, dyed from this, uh, all the organic material in the water. And so the name was born and the, and the logo, that bear paw came from the bears who, when we put in power poles, were ripping their claw marks in our power poles, marking their turf. And wow. so we had to give them credence and, and we just figured it out. And the, you know, the SEAL teams, Special Forces units were our first customers, and then after a terrible uh, event like Columbine High School, right, in the 90s, remember the two remember. active shooters, kind of the first big public active shooter disaster, and there was dozens of police units that showed up, and they surrounded the place, and they tried to negotiate. Obviously, the, it was a different paradigm, and so we actually built a mock-up of a high school called Are You Ready High School, where we trained thousands of police officers to go in and solve the immediate threat. At Blackwater facilities. At the, at, at the compound. And where was the compound built? It was in North Carolina, northeast corner, just south of, uh, of Norfolk. So, so you purchased it. Huh, I bought uh, a whole bunch of land that had been logged and it was pretty ugly and, uh, and ended up building uh, a small comp compound, which became the largest private weapons training facility in the world. How many acres? It was just under 7,000. And it was nothing. Nothing was there. Nothing. You built it nothing. from the ground up. It literally hacked it out of the earth. Wow. So... It was, uh, it was very satisfying. And at peak volume, we were shooting around 1.3 million rounds per month. Wow. Yeah. And wow. safely. So 
Uh, we had um, tens of thousands of, of U.S. military, law enforcement, allied countries, and then uh, you know, and some civilians as well. So how do you go about selling that? You've got no experience. You've got this idea. You write a letter to your wife. Here's the blueprint. Here's what I'm going to do. You name it Blackwater. You purchase all this land. You build it up. How do you go about getting a government contract? What is the next step? The uh, in that case, the at, at that time, the the SEAL teams uh, down to a unit level could use a credit card to say, "Oh, we're going to go to this place," and it's probably a a fifteen or a twenty thousand dollar purchase. Okay. And so that's. That's how that starts. And really our first government contract, a large one, was after the USS Cole was blown up, right? There was a US Navy ship blown up by a suicide boat in Yemen. Uh, and the Navy had gotten so bad in Navy training that they weren't shooting live weapons anymore. They were shooting laser simulators because of safety. And so the, the sailors guarding the ship that day were largely holding unloaded weapons that they never fired before. And so the Navy came, because they'd, they'd optimized to fight at 100 miles, not at 100 meters. And so we ended up training tens of thousands of sailors to defend and to retake their ship from that kind of a threat. Wow. Yeah. So if you, know, if you look up Blackwater and its origins and things online, it gets messy. You know, some people say, Blackwater, this is bad. This is not the way things should be. And you have an interesting uh, perspective on, on those critiques. What is it? You know, in the, in the Vietnam War, the anti-war left went after the troops. And in the Iraq war this time, they went after contractors. And um, Blackwater represented everything they loved to hate. Mm -hmm. I was a, um, a heterosexual male with children uh, that owned a lot of guns in a, in a weapons training facility. And sometimes our guys were armed and sometimes they had to use those weapons to defend themselves or their US government protectees. And so it was a perfect, um, a perfect target for the frothing left to go after. Right, absolutely. And you know what's interesting is it's that tale as old as time, uh, a story of the government doing something in, in insufficiently and then a private industry coming and doing it better. Um, and I think I read somewhere that you said it was like USPS versus FedEx. Yeah, that's what we intended to be. Look, we're not there to replace the Postal Service. We just want to help them improve like FedEx did. Right. And uh, if you remove market forces from anything, you get a monopolistic, bloated disaster. That's exactly right. Okay, do you want to go, if you're sick, do you really want to go to the Veterans Administration or do you want to go to a private pay hospital? Private pay hospital any day of the week. Is, is school choice uh, in public education more effective or is the current state of public education in big cities in America? It, it's, very, it, it's very simple. So look, we wanted, when we started off as a training facility, we wanted to give the units that came an experience like they would if they went to a country club. Okay, we're not giving them luxury, but we're giving them punctuality, right? Because we're training SEAL teams who are doing serious stuff in a very serious schedule, and they're going to go to war. And so their ammunition is going to show up the day before. The guys are going to show up the day before. At 8 o'clock in the morning, they're going to show up. with a. We're going to give them a brief as to the safety, what they can do, what they can't do, and a radio. And that's done in 15 minutes, and they're on their way. No BS. The ranges are going to work. The chow time is at 12 o'clock. Don't be late because there's literally three shifts of, of, of running through the chow hall. And we just give them a machine that works predictably and reliably with no bureaucracy. And that's why they came. And they came in droves. How many years were you with Blackwater? Started in um, 97. And I sold it in 210. Oh, wow. When um, uh, at, at that point, the, the left said... We don't care what you do, but we're going to ride you until you, we destroy you or we put you in prison. And so I finally sold it for a, about one-tenth of what it had been worth just two years before and, uh, and moved on. Never back down to a left. You should have never backed down. You know what? When you're spending $2.5 million a month in legal fees, mm. it gets old. Uh, yeah, I bet. And um, uh, look, the, the nature of how the U.S. fights its wars... Uh, it's certainly changed, and I don't think anybody can look at how the U.S. has done in Afghanistan or Iraq and said, that's fantastic, we want to replicate that. Right. Because we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars, wasted thousands of American lives, and the health of tens of thousands of other veterans, and we haven't actually accomplished a whole lot. And so taking, a, the, taking the most expensive military in the world, which is very capable at doing conventional war, but then turning that and trying to go after and fight dudes fighting in flip-flops with a pickup truck, 
it's a different paradigm. Mm -hmm. And clearly the U.S. has never made the turn and adapted to that. Right. I actually want to go back and talk a little bit about the left and how they were able to sort of get in front of this narrative and, and cause a lot of hell for you on the back end. Because here's what I've always been curious about. You identify as libertarian. Yep. Libertarian. I'm, I'm, I'm conservative. Libertarian conservatism. I find it to be common, a common sense perspective. Yep. And yet we see that the left is able to have so much power when it comes into twisting the narrative and getting people to get up upset and basically argue for things that are going to ultimately harm them. In this case, we're talking about the security of America, right? It should be top notch. It should be privatized if we know that the way that they're doing it um, isn't actually working and it's not up to par. How were they able to be so effective in the face of common sense? One of the things is that there's a, there's a huge gap between the average American and all things foreign policy or military, right? If you think about it, you have an all-volunteer force now, which is about one half of 1% of the population. And there's another three or 4% that know that half percent, leaving the other 95% of America without a clue about anything to do with military operations, counterterrorism, or anything to do in foreign lands. And so they're totally unqualified to, um, to judge or to call BS. And so you have the longest war in American history and no one is called BS, except me, I think, on, on trying to change this paradigm of how you do it to rationalize it. I mean, people say they wanna support the troops and, and, and love their veterans, then they should demand better. Mm -hmm. It's the same with um, in, in talking about private education. You brought up school choice. Yep. And, and I say half of the hurdle is just making people educated about it. I mean, they think that you, you say the word school choice and it means that suddenly their kids are not going to be able to go to school or they're going to have to pay for their kids to go to private school. They don't understand the voucher program whatsoever. Right. How do we fix that? How do we make sure people are educated about these things? Look, I, I think um, – getting people educated as to to allowing market forces and price right i was i'm an austrian economics major from hillsdale and the first thing the most important thing that's that's removed from a socialist economy is the essential information that comes from price right price reflects scarce scarcity and demand but it also reflects exactly what something is worth to someone and so people say education uh, and private education, when they realize how much the taxpayers are spending for public education, and if you said, well, I'll take half that amount and spend it at this school over here down the street from, with some teachers that really care, it's a much better deal. And so injecting people with choice, actual market choices, makes them immediate capitalists and immediate believers, and they will defend it. Right, and then on the other side of that, by the way, for those of you that aren't aware, your sister fights in the same regard. Uh, Betsy DeVoe fights yep. for school choice, which is a big issue for me because I think, I mean, just the way that black Americans that live in inner cities are just getting the bad end of the stick. Look, the public education system was founded in America, backed by Thomas Jefferson, to give all kids from every walk of life, rich, poor, of any color, an equal shot at an education. Because if you really want to climb the ladder, an education can never be taken from you. But sadly, the education system has become so bureaucratic and uh, so defended by the permanent state that it is literally sequestering kids into a continuous loop of misery. Absolutely. And that is a great evil. Absolutely. I totally agree. So let's go back to you. So you, you, you throw in the towel on having to do with all the legal crap. And I, I totally get that. I really understand that. So then what do you do? I moved to the Middle East uh, because of piracy off the coast of Somalia. At that time, uh, it was 2010, 11, 12. There was, Somali pirates were taking an average of 80 to 90 ships per, per year, ransom of two to $5 million. And at that point, the UAE government uh, wanted to do something about it. And I gave them some ideas about building a police force and how to do that. And uh, you know, this is at a time kind of comparing big government approach versus a smaller market approach. Uh, at that time, the US Navy, European navies, the UN were patrolling all over the ocean trying to find pirates. And uh, you know, if you have a wasp problem in your yard, you don't chase after the wasps with a spray can, you find the nest and you deal with the nest. And it doesn't take a genius to find the pirates flying along the coast of Somalia because they anchor a thousand foot ship about a mile offshore. It's because they go out and grab that sucker out in the middle of the ocean, and they take it back and they anchor it and they gotta wait to get paid. And they're waiting six months to a year. So if you build a police unit and you roll up on that little village and you deny them the logistics support, they have no sanctuary anymore and it interrupts their logistics chain and the piracy goes away. 
largely without firing a shot. So you and moved so that to the unit, UAE. Moved there, put some ideas how to do that. That unit went active in 2012. And funny you don't hear about Somali piracy anymore. No, honestly, we don't, unless it's a movie. It's we amazing. Can, right? Well, the, the, the operation when the Navy went to the Captain Phillips, right? The, the U.S. captain that was rescued, that operation cost the taxpayers almost as much as our program did, which actually ended all the piracy. So, look, it was a, uh, it was a passion project, and it worked. And it, uh, it, it, it's not theoretical for me anymore from doing what we did at Blackwater and then taking a nagging problem that the international community was having a hard time solving. And oddly enough, it went away. And that program cost less than the pirates were taking in ransom every year. And at the same time, the Obama administration, the Obama State Department, Obama CIA did everything they could to block and thwart and shut down that program. Whoa. So it is a perfect example of the permanent state bureaucracy that doesn't want any interlocutor, any challenge, anything to the current state of, uh, I would say the current state of stupidity. Mm. I always say the government looks, when you ever talk to people that think we need to expand government, what they're talking about is just lining their own pockets, right? I mean, it's, I mean, some of the people that we have as employees, I think that there's an employee that goes around knocking on doors to make sure dads don't live in the home because they, mothers can get more welfare money. I mean, yeah. and, and, and obviously, you know, I believe in a limited, I have a limited government perspective and hearing what would, why would the president of the United States want to stop that program knowing that it was going to eliminate a problem? I don't know that it was... Uh, it, went to his level, but for heaven's sakes, all the permanent state bureaucrats in between did all they could to block it. Right. And the guys that the guys that actually went and did the job were called, um, uh, they were threatened for being embargoed and having their bank accounts frozen for doing exactly what the UN asked was to build counter piracy capability. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was really sad. And, to, and you know, there was enough in that program that they could have gone south in Somalia and finished Al-Shabaab, the terrible Al-Qaeda affiliate. But uh, the UN crushed it. So uh, I, 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 I'm, 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 we'll, we'll continually speak out on these issues because there's a lot of people, there's hundreds of millions of people that are living in great suffering in terrorism and deprivation because of a permanent state of bu bureaucratic idiocy that keeps them there. Right. You're okay? so passionate about security. It's the underpinning that makes economic development possible. Okay. Think about it. What is a farmer? Farmer takes long-term thinking, right? Because you have to you have to dig and plow and weed and clear a field and get the rocks out of it, planting a seed, watering it, hoping that eight months, nine months later, the crop comes up. That's long-term thinking. You can't steal or 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 finagle your way to success. Long-term thinking. You need to be secure enough to know that I'm putting all this work in now, that my crop is going to be secure, and I'm going to be able to bring it to market and sell it. Right. The, the hundreds of millions of Africans that are suffering uh, from a lack of security don't have that luxury uh, of long-term thinking. Right. That is exactly right. So when this government got, sh when this program got shuttered, what did you do after that? Did you keep doing independent contract stuff? Started, no, started uh, a, a, an investment firm, Frontier Resource Group. Came the, back home? Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. Came back to Virginia, um, but started a, uh, a, a geoscience business, right? So we fly around and we do uh, fly with a, a very high dollar box in the back of an airplane and it detects small changes of gravity and uh, the magnetic field of the earth. And it gives you a pretty good idea what's under the surface of the earth for oil and gas or minerals. Uh, and we built a bauxite mine. Bauxite is what you use to make aluminum. Uh, what's it? Bauxite. Bauxite. Yeah. It's the, it's the essential element that makes aluminum possible. Yeah, brush up on my science no, that's here. All right. Yeah. <laughs> And um, uh, and did some things in copper, and uh, again, you know, whether you're an advocate of green energy, traditional energy, if you're going to move electricity, you need copper because there's no substitute for copper wires. That's correct. I know that. I, I, that's actually one thing that I do know. <laughs> so you did that, and you do, you're doing a ton of stuff. I kind of took the knowledge of how to operate in difficult places and uh, and applied that into the resource space. So there's not many places we're afraid to go. So what's next for you? Um, working on a, uh, a fund, a bigger investment fund to do uh, some of the strategic minerals that you need to make electric vehicles uh, or, or more green energy, right? There's a, a big shift coming in electric vehicles. As much as I love a good four or 500 horsepower car, uh, electric vehicles are, are coming. You think so? 
Um, look, China makes half the world's electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. They are, it is very much state policy. China can't compete with the likes of, of the United States and the Europeans, the Japanese in internal combustion engines, right? Traditional pistons. So they've kind of gone all in on electric. And so the demand curve that comes with that for all the things it takes for an electric motor, for the batteries, uh, for the drivetrain, there's a big uptick in those minerals coming and you have to go find those and, and dig those in generally weird places to make that happen. So a question that I always ask all of my guests is, what drives you? You know, I had great, the thing my dad told me early on is you'll never have the satisfaction uh, like doing something on your own and building a business and employing people and, and employing a team. And, and he's right. I mean, the satisfaction I had of uh, building and running Blackwater and employing thousands of guys, I remember showing up uh, on the first, it was a C-5. It was the only time the Air Force provided any lift to us for our assets to get them into Iraq. And we were offloading Little Bird helicopters at two o'clock in the morning in Baghdad off a C-5. And there was a bunch of vets, uh, army vets that had been in uh, Mogadishu for Black Hawk Down. And he's standing there in his Hawaiian shirt and he goes, thanks, Mr. P. I never thought I'd get to do this stuff again. And uh, I love giving people a chance to do that, of getting really high RPM people, giving them a chance to be excellent at what they do and, and seeing what results. And are you optimistic or pessimistic about the direction that America is going in? You know, I'm giving a talk soon on uh, the threats to American liberty. And I don't believe it's, it's not China, it's not Russia, it's here. And the expanse and the explosive growth of the super state and how we allow government to permeate our lives at the state, local, and federal level, that, that is the problem. It is a far cry from what the Founding Fathers ever envisioned. And, uh, and that is the greatest threat to American liberty. So I'm, at this point, I am not, um, I'm generally an optimist on things, but I think things are gonna get worse before they're gonna get better. All right, well, I hate to say this, but my husband was right. The words I hate to say, he was right. You're an incredibly interesting character. Um, I, I, I can't wait to follow and see where you go with this. And I couldn't agree with you more about the threat that we face is 100% internal at the moment, the first threat that we face. I agree. Um, we wrap every single episode by allowing our guests to, live, to leave a two minute video message to the world. So you're gonna look into that camera and you're just gonna speak what's on your heart for two minutes if you wish. And My it had goodness. to become the thing, the call to action for every single person in the world. And I'll have you know that every single person in the world watches The Candace Owens Show. Are you ready? <laughs> or they should. Or they should. On your mark, get set, world, I give you Eric Prince. Look, like I said, uh, there's a lot of things that America is involved with overseas that can be done in a much simpler, smaller, cheaper way. I love the United States military. It needs to come home and to clean up uh, and to allow the private sector to work more closely with it to end these endless wars. Uh, again, because my, my great fear is that all the technology, all the capability that comes out of these endless wars and all the spending eventually gets, comes home uh, and it restricts our own liberty, okay? The surveillance state, the, the, all the counterterrorism policies end up uh, applying here as well. And so government expands at the cost incrementally of each American's liberty. And so we need to push out and to retake our liberty uh, and to restrain the growth of government. That's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming on. That was okay. awesome. All right, thanks. You got so much going on. Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.